thank you very much. Right, hello. Um, before we start, I should just give you a bit of a health warning. I'm going to be talking about money and economics. And the way things are, and the way the system has devised it, as soon as we see an economist talking, most of us glaze over because we don't understand it. Well, what I'm going to tell you now, the way I put it is this. If I can understand it, any one of you can understand it. Okay, this is not rocket science what you're getting. It's just common sense and what we've done before. Okay, there's the question. Why has the world not got enough money to prevent this from happening? And it's not just happening in the third world, it's happening here as well. We have the obscenity of having to have food banks so people can feed themselves and their families. Now have a look at this, have a look at this cartoon. I think it's absolutely brilliant. Happiness is just around the corner. Work harder, earn more money, buy more things, keep going. The system has put us on a treadmill of mass mindless production to meet mass mindless consumption. We're all chasing our tails, trying to be happy. When was the last time you actually had a politician who wanted to make you happy? I seem to remember David Cameron wanted to monitor our happiness. But when was the last time you actually had politicians working for our best interests because they actually want to make us all happy. Right, I think that sums up the system, doesn't it? The wealth of the 1% richest people in the world amounts to $110 trillion. That's 65 times the total wealth of the bottom half of the world's population. It's crazy. It's obscene. So why on earth do we allow it to happen? Why do we allow a mere handful of dynastic psychopaths, because that's what they are, decide how much money the world has to spend? Can somebody answer that? I can't. Why do we allow a system that literally allows a handful of families to decide how much money we all have to spend. It's crazy. Right, this is how I came into it. The gentleman sitting underneath the blue arrow is my uncle. Uncle by marriage, Sir Harry Pilkington. He was a lovely man, I have to say, and I won't say anything other. But he attended the first ever Bilderberg conference in 1954. A year later, he became a director of the Bank of England, a position he held until 1972. I went back to school on one occasion when I was 16, and we were on the train together because he was going down to one of his last meetings at the Bank of England. And he was, we were talking about all sorts of things, and then suddenly he broke off and said, what are you going to do when you leave school? So I said, I'll probably go in the family business family regiment, whatever, and he said, well, look, I'm going to give you two pieces of advice to take through life with you. The first is, never believe anything you read in the press because we control it. And the second thing he said was never, ever believe a politician when they say they can do something. They can't unless we say they can. The truth is, my uncle was just part of a network most of you have probably heard of these organizations. The Committee of 300, the Bilderberg Group, the Trilateral Commission, the Council on Foreign Relations, USA, European Council on Foreign Relations, Chatham House, the Pilgrim Group, Skull and Bones, and the Bohemian Grove. There are probably others as well. Effectively, what we're talking about here is the good and great meeting in private to discuss what's going to happen to us. All done in secrecy. No minutes taken, or at least we're not allowed to see the minutes. And we actually do actually have MPs who go to Bilderberg, who would go on to the Council on Foreign Relations and the Trilateral Commission. They go and meet and meet these people behind the scenes in complete secrecy. Or they have the Chatham House rules, as they call them. But the point is, you and I are not going to find out what's being discussed there. 
And that's the reason. That is how it, we are all controlled. Because we're not challenging these politicians, our elected servants. What the hell are they dealing with, these psychopaths? Right, if you can see that weird outline, in the, and you like that film Star Wars, it's not my cup of tea, if I'm honest with you, but I'm going to use this as an example. That's the Death Star. Okay, one of my friends actually calls it the Death Star. And I'll move on to that in a moment. But the Death Star, the hub of evil. The hub of all that is against what we stand for. Can anyone name what that building is? Well done, you're on the ball. I'll just let you know, you're about 1% of the population. And you're about 0.01% if you can actually tell me what the place does. This is the Bank for International Settlements. It's in Basel in Switzerland. It's quite incredible. I have asked, oh, I have asked probably about a dozen politicians and not one of them had heard of it, including the MP for this constituency, Sarah Wollaston, and my old MP was Tim Farron, leader of the Liberal Democrats. He actually admitted he understood nothing about money creation and he's now hopefully going to, he's trying to become a Deputy Prime Minister one day. Right, you can read all that. Controls 60 of the world's central banks, including the Bank of England, the Federal Reserve, and the European Central Bank. It oversees at least 95% of the world's money. It can operate in complete secrecy and is accountable to no one elected government. The City of London, or so we say the Bank of England, is supposedly answerable to the Chancellor of the Exchequer. No, it's not. And I'm just going to make the point that when Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of England, goes over to Basel in Switzerland for the weekend meetings they have about once every four, five, six weeks, and they meet at the top of the tower, they effectively are given their orders by the banking families. When he comes back, one of the directors of the Bank of England at the moment is Dave Prentice of Unison. I wonder if Dave Prentice knows what goes on at this Bank for International Settlements. I doubt it very much. I have written twice now to Dave Prentice, pointing this out to him and asking for a reply. I still haven't received one. Now, this is a book called Tragedy and Hope, written by Professor Carol Quigley. And I have to say, thank goodness he did. He was the mentor for the Clintons, for Bill Clinton. And he was actually, whilst he was an academic, he was trusted by the, if you call them a new world order, whatever you want to call them. Now, there's a lot to read here. This is what he wrote. The powers of financial capitalism had another far-reaching aim, nothing less than to create a world system of financial control in private hands, able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. This system was to be controlled in a feudalist fashion by the central banks of the world acting in concert by secret agreements, arrived at in frequent private meetings and conferences. The apex of the system was the Bank for International Settlements in Basel, Switzerland, a private bank owned and controlled by the world's central banks, which were themselves private corporations. The growth of financial capitalism made possible a centralization of world economic control and use of its power for the direct benefit of financiers and the indirect injury of all other economic groups. That's us, all of us. He goes on. It must not be felt that these heads of the world's chief central banks, like Mark Carney, were themselves substantive powers in the world finance. They were not. Rather, they were the technicians and agents of the dominant investment bankers of their own countries who had raised them up and were perfectly capable of throwing them down. The substantive financial powers of the world were in the hands of these investment bankers, also called international or merchant bankers, who renamed largely behind the scenes in their own unincorporated banks. These formed a system of international cooperation 
and national dominance, which was more private, more powerful, and more secret than that of their agents in the central banks. And we're talking about these groups. The House of Rothschild, the Warburgs, the Rockefellers, Goldman Sachs, Oppenheim, Medici, Morgan Stanley. There are a few more as well. It is said that the Rothschilds are worth something in the region of $15 trillion. I don't think people realize just how deep it all goes. And it doesn't always come under the same name Rothschild. Right. What is the biggest lie affecting mankind? It is very simple that sovereign nations have to borrow money, money that has been completely created out of thin air as debt from the private financial and banking sector. This is the big lie that all politicians of all political parties will not address. It is the big lie the economists will not address. It is the big lie that effectively all the system servers refuse to accept. Now, this is the Bank of England. This is from their quarterly report in the spring of 2014, I think it was. And this is the Bank of England actually admitting how money is created. In the modern economy, most money takes the form of bank deposits. But how those bank deposits are created is often misunderstood. The principal way is through commercial banks making loans. Whenever a bank makes a loan, it simultaneously creates a matching deposit in the borrower's bank account, thereby creating new money. It is a case of simply putting one figure in one side of the ledger and another figure in the other. Congratulations, you've just created money. So when you hear on the media all these banks who are being caught doing something naughty and you hear them being fined, how do you think they're going to pay that fine? They just merely enter the figure in one margin and out comes the other. It really is as simple as that. Now, the death of the debt star. It looks rather an interesting picture like that now. To put it bluntly, if we bring in sovereign national credit, and I'll explain in a moment what all this is, but if sovereign nations created, issued, and controlled all the money those nations needed to meet the security, prosperity, and happiness of the people, then quite simply, the central banking system of the world, the Rothschilds, all the people who control us, have their oxygen cut off. If these private bankers can no longer create the money for the world, they're finished. And quite literally, the threat of the so-called New World Order, Illuminati, I've heard it called many things. But that threat will disappear because they can no longer control us. And Britain's solution for dealing with these banksters is... The 1914 Treasury issued debt-free and interest-free Bradbury Pound. That, by the way, is a picture of the second issue of the Bradbury Pound. Right, I'm going to give you a quick overview of the story of the Bradbury. Right, let me tell you a little story. I had already twigged that Abraham Lincoln had won the American Civil War because somebody said there's nothing to stop the U.S. Treasury creating money that's based on the integrity of the U.S. government. I love that word, integrity. I always joke with people that if it was based on the integrity of our present government, I doubt if we could have a meal out at McDonald's. Not that I would want to anyway. The point is, it should be actually the wealth of the nation, and that's what it was. The greenback dollar. It was created based on the wealth of the American nation. And Abraham Lincoln managed to win the American Civil War by being able to pay for it that way. He did actually, affirm, he did actually approach the city of London and they offered him 26, 33% interest, 36% interest. And he knew that if he'd gone for war loans, if he'd borrowed from the private banks, he would have put the United States of America in a debt noose. So he didn't, and he created his own money, paper money, and it was called the greenback dollar. Now, I'd actually read about that, and I thought, hmm, that makes sense. Why can't we have a greenback pound? Just applying common sense. So I wrote an article, which the UK column very kindly uh, put in. About three months later, and I'll tell you exactly when it was, September 2012, the phone went. 
and uh, my wife was in the kitchen and my daughter was doing her homework and I picked up the phone and I said, yes, hello? Oh, is that uh, Justin Walker? I said, well, it might be. And he said, well, is that Justin Walker, the nephew of Sir Harry later, Lord Pilkington? I said, yes. Ah, good, he said. My father wants to give you a message. So I thought, right. My father was a director of the Bank of England with your uncle. And he's very ill. He's not long for this world. But he wants to give you a word to research. And by this time, I was thinking, gosh, this is, this is quite interesting. But then I realized there was no paper by the phone, no pen. My laptop was closed. And I thought, oh, my God, he's going to give me something to write down. And I've got no way of doing it. So I blew on the window. And he said, we want you to research the word Bradbury. So I wrote down Bradbury. He said, if you research the word Bradbury, my father says you will find a solution to all of Britain's economic woes. So I said, right, thank you. He said, now, you won't be able to trace this call, but it's been nice talking to you. Please investigate, or worse to that effect. And he just said goodbye. I did 1471, number withheld. So I immediately got my laptop open, fed in the word Bradbury, and I got that nice lady, jo Joanna Lum no, not jo Bradbury or somebody, who goes around walking along walks and stuff. And then I got the chap who, who wrote the Martian Chronicles, and I thought, well, I'm not doing very well here. Bradbury, Bradbury, what does this mean? And then suddenly I saw Bradbury Pound, and this was basically the um, people who, who uh, collect notes, treasury notes and bank notes. So anyway, I eventually came across this chap, the Right Honourable Thomas Johnston MP, uh, ex-Lord Privy Seal, author of The Financiers and the Nation, written in 1934. Now, this gentleman is quite unusual. He's a socialist, but he is probably one of the very few MPs I have never found a bad word said against. He was thoroughly honourable, and he's gone down in history as being the father of the Scottish hydroelectric scheme. He's actually done a lot of good work. Okay, next scheme. Now, he told the story thus. At the outbreak of the First World War, there was only £9 million worth of gold in the Bank of England. And in those days, the money was measured on gold. It was the gold standard. And the bankers knew that at the outbreak of war, that means a huge amount of uncertainty. And some people would prefer to get their money out and stick the gold under the pillow or under the mattress or wherever. And they realized that if all the people did that, or a sizable number of the people did that, there was going to be a run on the banks. And that's about the last thing you want when a country is mobilizing for war. Now, David Lloyd George was the Chancellor of the Exchequer at that time, and the top bankers went to see him. The banks immediately closed. It was bank holiday, but they actually closed a lot longer. And this is actually a, 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 sign, a copy of a sign I got from the Bank of England website, and this is addressed to managers of one particular bank. Uh, and basically, by ordering council, the bank holiday is extended to include Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So in other words, what they were saying was the banks were going to be shut until the 7th of August. Now, whilst all that was happening, all hell was breaking loose in Parliament. Effectively, there was a Currency Banknotes Act passed through Parliament in two days. I've actually read Hansard, and it's fascinating. When you read Hansard, because it's every, every word uttered, and you read it, and it's quite, you know, you actually feel you are listening to real history. But in a case of three days, they passed the act and got the printers going to print the first version of the Bradbury. And it was on stamp paper, and it was printed on one side only. And it was done in one pound and 10 shillings, 50 pence for those who can't remember what 10 shillings is. Now, this is what, this is what Thomas Johnston wrote. The new currency had been issued by the state, was backed by the credit of the state, and was issued to the banks to prevent the banks from utter collapse. The public cheerfully accepted the new notes, and nobody talked about inflation. Now, the first thing we always hear from the 
system-serving economists and politicians, they say, if you print money, you're just printing money, you'll have hyperinflation. And they'll mention the Weimar Republic. Well, I've actually researched the Weimar Republic, and it was not a case of the Weimar Republic's treasury creating, issuing, and controlling the money that caused the hyperinflation. Oh, no. It was the private Bundesbank, the private central bank of Germany, the Weimar Republic, that was printing the money. And the government wasn't even authorizing most of it. And it was the currency speculators in Wall Street and the city of London that were fanning the flames. In other words, the Weimar Republic was caused by the private banking institutions. It was not caused by the government. The government had to react to it. So when you see those pictures of a, a gentleman going to the bakers to buy a loaf of bread with a barrow load of paper money, and that happened in Zimbabwe as well, and again, the big multinational companies played their part there. So printing money, if done properly, works. Now, 1914, they've printed 300 million pounds worth of Bradbury's. Debt-free, interest-free, no national debt, no additional extra money going on to the national debt. Suddenly, David Lloyd George had second thoughts. And he said, hang on a moment, we will phase this out. We will phase the Bradbury out. Now, this is a lovely slide, this. Why did he suddenly phase out the Bradbury pound. In fact, the last Bradbury came out in about 1926. But suddenly, to win the war, they suddenly wound it down. Instead, the bankers said, we want you to go back to selling us bonds. Three and a half, four and a half, five and a half percent interest. In other words, with the Bradbury pound, with the Bradbury pound, the bankers could not make a killing out of the killing. So they had to do something. They'd been bailed out. They'd had a collapse of the banks had been stopped in 1914. But then the bankers realized they couldn't make a killing out of the war itself. And as we all know, bankers like wars. They like selling, they like loaning money to build up the weaponry. They like to loan money for the killing, for the armaments. And they like to loan money then to rebuild the countries after the war. Wars are good for the private bankers. And it's been the same ever since the Second World War. Let's have a look at this slide. I had great fun doing this last night. Right, the corporation, City of London. Then we've got Parliament. Do you know who that chap is on the top right-hand side? He looks like something out of Harry Potter. Do you know who he is? Oh, he's a he's the city remembrancer. Anyone heard of a chap called the city remembrancer? No, he's a servant of the city of London. He sits in Parliament with our elected servants, with our MPs, and he basically makes sure that MPs toe the line, that they don't ask questions: Why can't we print a new form of the Bradbury to sort out the NHS? to stop the food banks, to stop austerity dead, to protect our strategic industries, to encourage people to set up small human-scale businesses, to make sure our children have proper free education without paying for it. Yeah, I could go on, the list can go on and on and on what the Bradbury would do to help our country. It's a solution. These MPs here just offer hope and change, but they will not go near solutions. And I'm just about finished writing an article, if I can just turn this over, and it will be launched on Monday, and it's called Fake Hope, Fake Austerity, Fake Democracy, an essay that reflects only sadness and disappointment. Is there no one left in the House of Commons with decency, integrity, and honour? I had hoped that Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell would be two people who would stand up because they actually signed an early day motion, 748, in November 2013 to bring back the Bradbury Pound. Since then, we've been trying to have a meeting with John McDonnell 
and we have repeatedly emailed them with all the things about the Bradbury Pound that they know about. They don't want to act. They don't want to make a move at all. I think you are right, Sasha. I think the remembrance, he doesn't look, he looks, as I said, he looks a weird figure, but he is extremely powerful. By the way, have you seen the, uh, the sort of the uh, checkboard, the checkboard? No. Have a look at our Freemasonry friends here from the City of London. And of course, they're on their checkboard as well. And of course, down below, there we are, that's the, that's the Chancellor's dinner, you know, when he speaks. We've got the Bank of England. Then we've got the uh, Common Purpose Sold. And Brian will probably touch on that later on, but effectively, uh, all our politicians are, I'm afraid, towing the line of the City of London and the bankers. It is very sad to say this, but our elected servants are not serving us. They are serving the corporate elite. Okay. Now, it's time to take back our country. Oh, gosh, I thought I was going to break into Churchill then. Sorry, I don't... On November the 18th, 2016, 520 people met at the Guildhall Winchester to unanimously pass the Winchester Declaration. Now, uh, you can go online and you can read it, but basically it falls into two parts. The first part we haven't discussed, but we're just going to briefly. And it is probably the most important part. But, do you remember we've just had the Supreme Court a highly dubious organization, if ever there was one, because it was created in the time of Tony Blair and all that sort of stuff. But the Supreme Court made their announcement that Parliament was sovereign. Parliament is not sovereign. You are. We are. We, the people, are sovereign. And the way we do this is to refer back to Magna Carta 1215 and before then. Because Magna Carta is merely enshrining what had gone before. The common law, the law of the land. God's law, common law, natural law, doesn't matter what you call it. It is common sense. And it is the jury, jury-led system. That is, if you go up for trial, you go before your peers and they decide whether you are reasonable or unreasonable. They even decide what your fate should be if you were considered unreasonable, guilty in other words. But, and this is something you don't know, or at least the judges don't tell people when you are acting as on a jury, a jury has an absolute right to annul bad legislation passed by our servants in Parliament. Quite simply, they find somebody not guilty, even though the statute may have been breached by that individual, because bear in mind, Parliament do not pass laws. They pass statutes. They're acts. They're not laws. Law is the common law. And people don't realize this. So, in fact, we the people can ultimately keep control of what they get up to in Parliament. And have you noticed now that Parliament has literally created thousands of statutes to micromanage our lives? When in fact, under the common law, you are free to do whatever you like until you breach somebody else's freedom. And that's when common sense then kicks in and you have a trial. Common law is about you don't cause harm to anyone, you don't cause loss to anyone, you don't commit a breach of the peace, and you don't conduct your affairs with mischief. Which, of course, is exactly what the private banking world do. And this is our secret weapon to use against them. I'm, I'm, I'm just doing a humble parking ticket. Humble parking ticket. It's great fun, because I've simply said I will pay it. But first, I want a letter written by a human being with a soul, written in wet ink, that that PCN, the parking ticket, is both legal and lawful. Oh, it's legal because the, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the MPs or the councillors have passed it in you know, what is considered to be democracy. But it's not lawful because under Article 39 of Magna Carta, which, by the way, cannot be repealed 
by the politicians. You often hear that Magna Carta has been repealed. No, it can't, because Magna Carta was a peace treaty between a lawless king and us, the people. Not the baron. The barons, mean old, in old French, means free people. Us, all of us. It wasn't just the nobility, as we're led to believe. It was for all of us. And Parliament, unfortunately for them, they cannot repeal Magna Carta 1215. The first Parliament of Simon de Montfort came in 50 years after Magna Carta. They cannot interfere with it in any shape or form. If any politician tells otherwise, they are guilty of treason. So, getting back to what we're doing. So, the declaration falls into two parts. First of all, trial by jury. The second part is what we've already discussed. That is a sovereign nation creating, issuing, and controlling all the money needed for our prosperity and future happiness. Right. We are organizing. You, we've probably seen that quite a few local groups are actually helping people who are having their houses, businesses taken off them unlawfully by the banks. Remember, the banks create money out of thin air as debt. And quite simply, we are seeing through all the paperwork we are. We have got people who, I mean, county courts, just give you an example. A county court, a judge acts as judge and jury. That is alien to the common law. No jury involved. That judge is guilty of treason because his oath of office is to uphold of the law of the land. And we actually did arrest a judge in Birkenhead about five years ago now. Suddenly, 500 people turned up from nowhere and took them by surprise. This is going to happen all the time now. People are waking up to the truth. So... We are coming to a street near you. We are going to come with the rule of law. We're going to return back to what is rightfully ours. Right, this is the advert now. We had the Winchester Declaration. We've drawn our line in the sand. We're not retreating from that. We're only going to advance. But to advance, we've got to become a mass movement. We've got to become not organized, we're not a hierarchical, we want to be linear. But we want to have hubs of activity all around, waking people up to the truth about their own past, to empower people, to show them what they can do against this evil. Because that is what's happening, because I've, there's one aspect I've not mentioned today, and that is child abuse and establishment-led paedophile rings. Now, I think Brian will probably touch on that in more detail. But those people in Parliament are not just stopping us from being able to create, issue and control our own money, to get rid of austerity, to get rid of food banks, to get rid of suffering, but we're also seeing children on a completely unimaginable scale also suffering. And they know it's going on. They're either paedophiles themselves or they are protecting paedophiles. And Melanie Shaw is in prison, and she is a whistleblower who knows what's going on with our political class and what's really happening. And she's in prison. So we are living in a lawless country. But there are solutions. And that is now the next stage. We're going to become a movement, a mass movement, armed with solutions. Not hope, not offering change, we're coming to restore the rule of law with solutions. Thank you very much.